Hi, happy Monday. I hope that you had a wonderful weekend. I'm Mary, a librarian at the Claremont Branch Library, and because it's Monday, it is time for our weekly poetry reading. A reminder that this is actually going to be the last poetry reading that I'm going to be doing. We've been doing this for a little over three months, and it's time to start something new. So today I am just going to share with you a variety of different poems. Some sort of have a theme, but just some fun poems to end with. So I hope that you have been enjoying listening to the poetry. I have been enjoying sharing it with you. So we will start with a few poems that are sort of on the theme of water and snow. The first poem is by Wallace Stevens and it is called The Snowman. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow, and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves which is the sound of the land, full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. For the listener, who listens in the snow, and nothing himself beholds, nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. Next poem is by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it is called Water. The water understands civilization well. It wets my foot, but prettily. It chills my life, but wittily. It is not disconcerted. It is not broken-hearted. Well used, it decketh joy. Adorneth, doubleth joy. Ill used, it will destroy, in perfect time and measure, with a face of golden pleasure, elegantly destroy. Last poem dealing with sort of the water theme is Weep You No More Sad Fountains. And it is uh, from the early 17th century, but they do not know who wrote it. Weep you no more sad fountains. What need you flow so fast? Look how the snowy mountains, heaven's sun doth gently waste. But my son's heavenly eyes view not your weeping that now lies sleeping, softly, now softly lies sleeping. Sleep is a reconciling, a rest that peace begets. Doth not the sun rise smiling when fair at even he sets? Rest you then, rest sad eyes, melt not in weeping while she lies sleeping. Softly, now softly, lies sleeping. Moving on to some poems that deal with shadow as a theme, either directly or indirectly, they all have something of a shadow in them. And the first is by Thomas Campion, and it is called Follow Thy Fair Son. Follow thy fair son, unhappy shadow, though thou be black as night, and she made all of light. Yet follow thy fair son, unhappy shadow. Follow her whose light thy light depriveth, though here thou livest disgraced. And she in heaven is placed, yet follow her whose light the world reviveth. Follow those pure beams whose beauty burneth, that so have scorched thee. As thou still black must be, till her kind beams thy black to brightness turneth. Follow her while yet her glory shineth. There comes a luckless night that will dim all her light, and this the black unhappy shade divineth. Follow still, since so thy fate's ordained. The sun must have his shade, till both at once do fade. The sun still proved, the shadow still disdained. Next poem is a bit of a fun one. It is called My Shadow and it is by Robert Louis Stevenson. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. 
and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. He is very, very like me, from the heels up to the head, and I see him jump before me when I jump into my bed. The funniest thing about him is the way he likes to grow, not at all like proper children, which is always very slow, for he sometimes shoots up taller than an India rubber ball, and he sometimes gets so little that there's none of him at all. He hasn't got a notion of how children ought to play, and can only make a fool of me in every sort of way. He stays so close beside me, he's a coward, you can see. I'd think shame to stick to Nursey, as that shadow sticks to me. One morning, very early, before the sun wakes up, I rose and found the shining dew on every buttercup. But my lazy little shadow, like an errant sleepy head, had stayed at home behind me and was very fast asleep in bed. And this is a poem by Queen Elizabeth I on Monsieur's departure. I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute, but inwardly do prate. I am and not, I freeze and yet am burned, since from myself another self I turned. My care is like my shadow in the sun, follows me flying, flies when I pursue it, stands and lies by me, doth what I have done. He too, his too familiar care doth make me rue it. No means I find to rid him from my breast, till by the end of things it be suppressed. Some gentler passion slide into my mind, for I am soft and made of melting snow. Or be more cruel, love, and so be kind. Or me, let me float or sink, be high or low. Or let me live with some more sweet content, or die and so forget what love e'er meant. Two poems about the moon that are both by Percy Shelley. The Waning Moon. And like a dying lady, lean and pale, who totters forth, wrapped in a gauzy veil, out of her chamber, led by the insane and feeble wanderings of her fading brain. The moon arose up in the murky east, a white and shapeless mass. And this is also by Percy Shelley, Art Thou Pale for Weariness. Art thou pale for weariness of climbing heaven and gazing on the earth, wandering companionless among the stars that have a different birth, and ever changing like a joyless eye that finds no object worth its constancy. This is moving to a slightly different theme of just nature and wind and summer, um, and our interactions with, with nature. This is called Summer Wind, and it is by William Cullen Bryant. In a sultry day, the sun has drunk the dew that lay upon the morning grass. There is no rustling in the lofty elm that canopies my dwelling, and its shade scarce cools me. All is silent, save the faint and interrupted murmur of the bee, settling on the sick flowers, and then again, instantly, on the wing. The plants around feel the two potent fervors. The tall maize rolls up its long green leaves, the clover droops its tender foliage, and declines its blooms. But far in the fierce sunshine tower the hills, with all their growth of woods, silent and stern, as if the scorching heat and dazzling light were but an element they loved. Bright clouds, motionless pillars of the brazen heaven, their bases on the mountains, their white tops, shining in the far ether, fire the air with a reflected radiance, and make turn 
the gazer's eye away. For me, I lie languidly in the shade, where the thick turf, yet virgin from the kisses of the sun, retains some freshness, and I woo the wind that still delays his coming. Why so slow, gentle and voluble spirit of the air? O oh, come and breathe upon the fainting earth coolness and life. Is it that in his caves he hears me? See, on yonder woody ridge, the pine is bending his proud top, and now, among the nearer groves, chestnut and oak are tossing their green boughs about. He comes, lo, where the grassy meadow runs in waves. The deep, distressful silence of the scene breaks up with mingling of unnumbered sounds and universal motion. He is come, shaking a shower of blossoms from the shrubs and bearing on their fragrance. And he brings music of birds and rustling of young boughs and sound of swaying branches and the voice of distant waterfalls. And all the green herbs are stirring in his breath, a thousand flowers by the roadside and the borders of the brook nod gaily to each other. Glossy leaves are twinkling in the sun as if the dew were on them yet and silver waters break into small waves and sparkle as he comes. And this is called My Triumph, and it's by John Greenleaf Whittier. The autumn time has come on woods that dream of bloom, and over purpling vines the low sun fainter shines. The aster flower is fa failing, the hazel's gold is paling, yet overhead more near the eternal stars appear, and present gratitude ensures the future's good, and for the things I see, I trust the things to be, that in the paths untrod and the long days of God, my feet shall still be led, my heart be comforted. O living friends who love me, O dear ones gone above me, careless of other fame, I lead, leave to you my name. Hide it from idle praises, Save it from evil phrases. Why, when we dear lips that spake it are dumb, should strangers wake it? Let the curtain fall. I better know than all how little I have gained, how vast the unattained. Not by the page word painted, let life be banned or sainted. Deeper than written scroll, the colors of the soul. Sweeter than any sung, my songs that found no tongue, nobler than any fact, my wish that failed to act. Others shall sing the song, others shall write the wrong, finish what I begin, and all I fail of win. What matter I or they, mine or another's day? So the right word be said, and life the sweeter made. Hail to the coming singers, Hail to the brave light bringers. Forward I reach and stare, all that they sing and dare. The airs of heaven blow o'er me, a glory shines before me of what mankind shall be, pure, generous, brave, and free. A dream of man and woman, diviner but still human, solving the riddle old, shaping the age of gold. The love of God and neighbor an equal-handed labor, the richer life where beauty walks hand in hand with duty, ring bells in unreared steeples, the joy of unborn peoples, sound trumpets far off blown, your triumph is my own, parcel and part of all, I keep the festival, for reach the good to be, and share the victory, I feel the earth move sunward, I join the great march onward, and take by faith while living my freehold of thanksgiving. And moving on to the next poem is following sort of a similar theme of beauty in nature, and it is called God's Grandeur, and it's by Gerard Manley Hopkins. 
The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. All for this nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last nights, the last lights off the black west wind, oh morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. Next poem is by Thomas Hardy, who's probably better known as an author of novels than poetry, but he did write a number of poems, and this is his poem called Darkling Thrush. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the sentry's corpse outliant, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arung, arose among the t bleak twigs overhead, in a full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled though his happy good night air, some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware. This is by Sir Walter Raleigh, and it is called The Nymph's Reply to the Shepherd. If all the world were love, and love were young, and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might me move to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives the flocks from field to fold when rivers rage and rocks grow cold. And Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complain of cares to come. The flowers do fade and wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall, is fancy's spring, but sorrows fall. Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, thy cap, thy kirtle, and thy poses, soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten, in folly ripe, in reason rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, thy coral clasps and amber studs, all these in me no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. But could youth last and love still breed, had joys no date, nor age no need, then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. And here is a sonnet by Henry Constable. My lady's presence makes the roses red, because to see her lips they blush for shame. The lily's leaves for envy pale become, and her white hands in them this envy bred. The marigold, the leaves, abroad doth spread, because the sun's and her power is the same. The violet of purple color came, dyed in the blood she made my heart to shed. In brief, all flowers from her their virtue take. From her sweet breath their sweet smells do proceed. The living heat which her eye beams doth make warmeth the ground and quickeneth the seed. 
the rain wherewith she watereth the flowers falls from mine eyes, which she dissolves in showers. And this next poem, we're going into somewhat more abstract poems for a few. This is called Forgetfulness by Hart Crane. Forgetfulness is like a song that, freed from beat and measure, wanders. Forgetfulness is like a bird whose wings are reconciled, outspread and motionless, a bird that coasts the wind unwearyingly. Forgetfulness is rain at night, or an old house in a forest, or a child. Forgetfulness is white, white as a blasted tree, and it may stun the sibyl into prophecy, or bury the gods. I can remember much forgetfulness. This next poem is by Ella Wheeler Wilcox, and it is simply called Solitude. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grieve, and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. Succeed and give, and it helps you live but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. And this is called To a Steamroller, and it's by Marianne Moore. The illustration is nothing to you without the application. You lack half wit. You crush all the particles down into close conformity and then walk back and forth on them. Sparkling chips of rock are crushed down to the level of the parent block. We're not in personal judgment in aesthetic matters, a metaphysical impossibility. You might fairly achieve it. As for butterflies, I can hardly conceive of ones attending upon you, but to question the congruence of the complement is vain, if it exists. And we are going to end with a few poems by Emily Dickinson and then a few by Christina Rossetti, who are some of my favorite poets. So this is poem number 505 by Emily Dickinson. I would not paint a picture. I'd rather be the one. It's bright impossibility to dwell delicious on, and wonder how the fingers feel, whose rare celestial stir evokes so sweet a torment, such sumptuous despair. I would not talk like cornets, I'd rather be the one, raised softly to the ceilings, and out and easy on, through villages of ether, my self-endued balloon, but a lip of metal the peer of my pontoon. Nor would I be a poet, its finer, own the ear, enamored, impotent, content, the license to revere, a privilege so awful, what would the dower be, had I the art to stun myself with bolts of melody? And this is her poem number 258. There's a certain slant of light winter afternoons that oppress like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar but internal difference where the meanings are. None may teach it. Any tis the seal despair. An imperial affliction sent of us, sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens Shadows hold their breath. When it goes, 
tis like the distance on the look of death. This is the last one from Emily Dickinson that I have, and it's poem number 1540. As imperceptibly as grief, the summer lapsed away, too imperceptible at last to seem like perfidy, a quietness distilled as twilight long begun, or nature spending with herself sequestered afternoon. The dusk drew earlier in, the morning foreign shone, a courteous yet harrowing grace, as guest that would be gone. And thus, without a wing, our service of a keel, our summer made her light escape into the beautiful. And we are ending with two poems by Christina Rossetti. The first is called Uphill. Does the road rind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the day's journey take the whole long day? From morn to night, my friend. But is there for the night a resting place? A roof for when the slow dark hours begin. May not the darkness hide it from my face? You cannot miss that inn. Shall I meet other wayfarers at night? Those who have gone before. Then must I knock or call when just in sight? They will not keep you standing at the door. Shall I find comfort, travel sore and weak? Of labor you shall find the sum. Will there be beds for me and all who seek? Yea, beds for all who come. And for our last poem of our poetry, weekly poetry series, it's a poem called Remember by Rosette, Christina Rossetti. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me. You understand it will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness of corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile than you should remember and be sad. And those are the poems I have for you today. And that will end our series here on reading poetry on Mondays. Again, we'll be starting something else up. But I hope that you have enjoyed uh, listening to these poems. I have enjoyed sharing with them with you these last uh, three and a piece months. So um, I hope that you have a wonderful week and that you will come back and see what we will be doing next. Until then, take care of yourselves and enjoy your week.